Hello, guys. Thanks for joining us uh, this evening. I know it's that time where uh, everybody's expecting a prime minister to let us know what's happening with the lockdown and what have you. And I think it has a particular interest to all of us who are involved in the world of snooker. But uh, I think you can expect anything to happen. So, this evening we've got, uh, we've got Fergal O'Brien and Jordan Brown, both tour professionals. And we're going to have a little chat with them about their careers and where they're going. And you can send in some questions if you want. And. Um, We'll crack on here. We'll just try and get the boys on the screen here. We'll start with the old man first. We can find him. You got me. Let's bring you in there, Jordan. We time here. Can you see me? Hang on a second, lads. I'm just going to try and bring you in. Of. Uh, All right, we're all in there. Can you Good hear evening. me? Good evening. Hello. Good evening. Fergal, can you hear me? Yes, unfortunately. Okay, that's a... That's I a can't see Fergal, I can see you, Dave. You can't hear Fergal? I, ca I, can, I can't see Fergal, I can hear him. Right, okay, well that is probably possibly your end but as long as we as long as the viewers can see uh right, okay. everything there jordy maybe you want to fiddle around with your uh your um video connection there maybe see what you can do anyway lads thanks for joining us uh we're just going to yeah. reach up for about an hour this evening i think the i think the prime minister is just about to come on and tell the nation where we're going here with the uh, with the pandemic yeah. And we're all waiting to hear whether we can walk out the doors or go to the clubs. I don't think we're expecting anything good, you know, but um, you never know. Anything can happen. But, guys, this is all on YouTube, uh, this um, this stream, so you can have a look at it tomorrow. Okay. Or you can have a look at it in about 10 yeah. years or whatever ago. But anyway, I'll we'll say, Fergal, thanks for joining us. Uh, yeah, no problem. We're going to start with you, and we're going to talk a wee bit about your uh, about your career. Now you, you turned pro in '91, so you've you've had you've been on the tour for nearly thirty years. Yeah. Does it feel like it? Not really. No, it's actually went very quick. Um, it's only when somebody says it to you that you actually when you start doing the maths, like thirty is a lot. But uh, now it's it's went very quick, to be honest. What do you think about, I mean, as I say, you turned pro in 81, so it's nearly 30 years. This is three decades. You know, I mean, I've just had a little look at your timeline there and what you've done. And, you know, your, your first your first sort of decade, you sort of gradually climbed the rankings. You did quite well, actually, you know, through the course of that period of time, up the first 10 years, up to 2000. Yeah. You know, you got yourself in, got yourself in the top 30, 32 fairly well fairly quickly and then obviously you got in the top 16 as well and you juggle a little bit in the middle there and that second phase if you want to call it i i don't know what you call it but i if i look at three decades i i sort of look at it as a, a beginning a middle and an ending <laughs> no no the 30 years i call it the first half the first half <laughs> <laughs> when i'm dead you know it's stop playing it's gone then after that there. So we'll just touch <laughs> let's let's just have a little look at it then. I mean obviously you wanna you, you know look you, you can you can play 30 years, you can play 20 years, whatever. I mean you did win a ranking event, you know, you got you yeah. got the final of a couple of others. You did win a couple of other events, which would probably be ranking events these days, you know, with, with what's on on the tour and what have yeah. you. So you've all you've you've always got I mean you've got close, you've beaten the best of them too. I don't need to mention yeah, any, yeah. but you've beaten Ronnie. You've beaten all a lot of top big players, and you you wouldn't have you wouldn't have been on the tour for thirty years if you didn't have it, you know, in that in, in that sense. But when you when, when you sort of look over your career, if you look at whatever way you want to look at it, the first ten years, the second, whatever, you know, what, what sort of reflection do you have on it 
have you done enough? Could you have done more? Um, I think as you get old, you, obviously you learn more about yourself. And it's definitely, well, it's, I'll always give myself credit. I definitely worked hard. So I wouldn't say, you know, if I didn't get, if I didn't do better, I wasn't through a lack of effort. But maybe my effort could have been more constructive or smarter. Um, there's probably times maybe actually I over-practiced or maybe over-prepared for tournaments and went away maybe a little bit stale and hadn't hadn't peaked so much. So at the time, I thought I was doing best. But yes, uh, looking back, I uh, was giving advice to a younger a younger self and say maybe coming up to tournaments just ease off a little piece. Or I certainly feel even the last few years, I should have been playing people more often. I played a bit too much on my own. Um, and generally throughout my career, when I've had my best results or enjoyed playing the most, whether it be from the early days when I went to London or other successful times, the majority of my practice was against people. Um, whereas the last few years, maybe because uh, so, sometimes of my own choice, other times because the Joe Delaney's, Michael Judge, Patrick Wallace, Colin Gilchrist, who I used to practice with, were gone. So bar maybe Ken Doherty, you were playing a hell of a lot on your own. And I find if you play too much on your own, you either get uh, quite technical or if you play too much on your own, you actually kind of nearly do your head in a little piece. So, you know, even going forward for whatever is left, left of my career. And that's what even why the last six months or so, I've been going up to Antrim quite a lot and just been there for a few days. And then it's been perfect because literally every day I get to play either Jordan Michael Giorgio or Mark Allen, and particularly Mark has been playing absolutely fantastic. So even if you're getting beaten, you're coming home uh, a lot sharper. And that just identifies the, the, the areas you need to work on your game. And so you look at, I mean, I'm, I'm just looking over your career here. You had, uh, just get you back in a wee second, Jordan, we're not leaving you out. We get, uh, <laughs> just look at back. It's sort of like, no, that's okay. We'll get you back in a wee second. It's sort of like it, it took you nearly ten years to win that ranking event. Yeah. So I mean, so, so when you when, when you when you won that, did you did you feel as if you've really really done something any different than normal, or what did it take out of you? What did you have to do to get it? Well, it's funny. As I said, obviously, the first few years when I turned pro, it was the year they opened the game up, so there was seven hundred uh, turned pro nearly overnight. So to get to the the first year to to get to the crucible, you probably had to win about twelve matches. So after the first year, I was 192. Second year, I was up to 100, which was it, which which was like good progress. Um, and funny with 1999, I remember it quite well for two specific reasons. Uh, uh, firstly, a couple of weeks before, my grandfather had died, and he was the one at Christmas when I was eight. He bought me a like an eight by four table. So he used to practice a lot of that. So maybe it felt a little bit of I don't know inspiration or or destiny. Um, and such because there were certainly a lot of matches went very close and I was literally a couple of shots away from losing. But the, the big the big drive was uh, I, I April 11th was when I won the tournament. But on February the 24th, they announced the wild cards for the Irish Masters in Gops, Benson Hedges Irish Masters back there, which is obviously a massive event. I'd have played it in 94, 98. And I didn't get a wild card and they actually picked Michael Judge. And to be fair, like, Mike, Michael's a great guy, a great player, but at the time I was ranked 20 and he was ranked 60. And I just felt it didn't make sense or it was unfair that I'd been overlooked. Now, you could argue it was giving Michael a chance. But anyway, that date was February 24th. And I walked home from the club. It took about a half an hour to walk home. <clears throat> and that on the walk home, I kind of, in my head, wrote and rewrote my speech for what I was going to say after I won the tournament. Basically on the lines of, I can't remember the time, something on the lines of, uh, here's me winning a ranking event and I'm not deemed worthy of a place in a, a tournament in my own country, so to speak. Okay. So, now obviously, I'm, I'm right you, so when I won the tournament, obviously I never, I never mentioned that, because obviously that's quite petty as such. And obviously I mentioned my grandfather in the speech, but... That was that was a motivating uh, factor for me that that gave me that gave me an extra bit of, an extra bit of drive. Um, and funny enough, within a week or so, I'd already received a letter from Benson Hedges with Kevin Norton was the term director saying I w I'd got a wild card for next year. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I don't know. And it's just during that during that week, um, 
my mum and dad and aunt and uncle and cousins had came over for the whole week to Plymouth. So even if I lost the first match, they were there for the week. It didn't matter. So the, the week they choose to take a holiday and a bit of snooker, I end up going all the way and winning maybe just after my grandfather died. And I said, particularly in the quarterfinals, Peter Ebden missed two simple blues to beat me. And even the, you know, the semi-final and final were close. I could have easily lost many times. So I don't know if you call that destiny or I created myself by believing or being determined I was going to win the tournament six weeks beforehand. That that just, you know, obviously I, I, like I've done the same thing <laughs> in events following on and, and didn't go on and win them. But maybe just, I don't know, that timing or something, something went right. But I, I had a lot of, uh, I suppose, inspiration, a lot of determination to prove him wrong because I felt he made a bad decision. And to be fair, I, I proved him right. <laughs> So I mean that that it sounds like you're you were confidence driven then because you you know if you won that you won that ranking event a lot of things were were happening did did you feel that, that really did that did that improve your game and give you a lot of confidence when you had that that ranking event win? If anything, looking back, I probably didn't get enough. I probably didn't get enough confidence out of it. I probably didn't get the confidence out of and belief that I should have. If anything, it more felt a bit like a relief that. I would think that I'd won a tournament. You know, that, you know, maybe subconsciously I thought that, like, it, and it still applies now. If you answer the question, was Fergal O'Brien any good? You go, well, he won a ranking event. So that obviously separates you a little piece. Obviously, you can do you can do a lot more and win world titles. But I mean, for me, probably that was just a bare minimum with regard to making it that I'd won a ranking event. But I never really pushed on, probably as much as I, I certainly didn't do any harm, but I, I didn't really, uh, I, I probably didn't get the bounce out of it like you thought I might have done or should have done. Right. Now, just touch it on confidence. Jordan, we're going to come over to you. Oh, he's disappeared again, but he's popping in and out. I reckon he's picking his nose or something there, <laughs> Fergal. I don't know what he's doing. You know, we're going to get he's him back here in. The oh, here he comes back in again. I think, you know, the thing is, what it, it's a lot of it is about. I think a lot of it, uh, when you, this is the reason why I touched on your win and confidence. Confidence is a big, big thing. And I think it, it, it has a reflection on a lot of players. And this is where I'm going back over to Jordan here. We can get him on the bloody screen, you know. Uh, we, <laughs> but uh, I think a lot of it's about confidence, you know. And, and uh, let's yeah, see if we can get it back in again because I try, you know, tell you what, we need some proper professional broadcasting equipment here. But uh, no, you you touched on some very good points there, right, yeah, Jordy? We're gonna try and uh, Jordy, we're gonna try and keep you in the stream here, mate. You, you keep coming off that again, so that could be that could be maybe the phone or whatever. But we were talking about uh, talking about confidence. Anyway, well, I'm not gonna worry about him for a minute. He's not that excited, me, Fergal. You know? <laughs> I wouldn't say that. <laughs> we'll get him in. We'll, we'll get him in here. Yeah, no. Do you want to try and uh, maybe, Jordan, if you want to try and join through the computer or something? I don't know why that. Are you in a good signal area there? Can you hear me all right? Jordan, can you hear me? No, I can't. I don't think he can hear us very well. Let's see if I no, can get I, him I, in. I can, I can, my sign keeps going off, guys. Yeah, can you can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, Mike, but sometimes right. the sound and picture just goes off. Right. Okay, yeah, no, it's it's probably it may be a connection. We're just talking about confidence, sir. So I'm just yeah. going to turn over to you for a minute, mate, if you can hear me all right. You know, off again. You, were, you were on the tour maybe 10 years ago. Two seconds, two seconds. You want to come off and come on again? Are you getting nothing? Can you hear me? Absolutely nothing. Do you want to, do you want to go off and try and log on through the computer or... Or do you have access? Do you have access to a computer at all? Try and maybe try and change position, go to another part of the room or something and reconnect. Anyway, look, we'll come back to you, Fergal. <laughs> and that there. But um it'll probably keep coming in and join us. Bloody irritating because it throws your momentum way out the window here. You know, you don't know where you are. <laughs> but um just ask yeah, another so question and let me know. Wonder. Obviously, I know absolutely. I got to keep you going. So, where do you think? Where are you? Where are you at the moment in the game? Where do you feel? Where you are at the moment, presently? 
well, obviously, ranking wise, obviously, I'm under pressure. I'm outside the top 64 with, well, hopefully, the world championship still to come. So, obviously, I'd need, you need something to win, probably definitely one, but maybe two, three matches to make, keep my place. But yeah. uh, mentally, and myself, yeah. I'm, I'm nowhere near done. You know, like I, I'm not. If if I fell off the tour, I'd go and it, I'd go straight to Q school. I've no, I'd have no issue with that. So I'm not ready. I may fall off, but I'm not ready to retire. I don't feel in any way I'm done. And obviously, I'd love to stay on. I think my game is good enough, and I still think I've got more years in me. But obviously, I need results to give myself that opportunity to, to. But I, I'm, I, you know, I, I haven't been thought about retiring or stop playing. I just want to keep playing as long as possible. So. The decision might be taken out of my hands, but you know, I just want to keep playing. I'm still very um, enthusiastic, still put the work in, still feel I can improve. And as I said, as you get older, you learn more. So I still feel, look, at some point when you're 70 or 80, you have all the experience in the world, but you physically can't do it anymore. Mm -hmm. But I feel, I feel like I still can do it. I can still play every shot and do whatever I, I could. 30 oh. years ago. Oh. So I, I don't feel any diminishment in my skills, but obviously other factors, you know, doesn't necessarily mean uh, you, you get the results that you want. You just, I mean, you play just like Steve Davis. It did in so many ways. Steve just carried on, Steve Davis carried on playing uh, yeah. uh, as long as he could. I, I, I can't remember when Steve came out. I think he was, was he in his mid fifties? Yeah, mid fifties. Yeah, I mean, look, you're, look, you're provisionally ranked 69. I think, I think you're provisionally ranked 69. So, I mean, you're 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 close there anyway. So perhaps maybe having a little bit of a reflection on the end of this season because of what's going on at the minute. It yeah, doesn't exactly. look like we're finished, really. You know, unless we get the worlds behind doors. But I mean, uh, how have you felt this season in particular? Again, kind of what I said earlier. I definitely think. Uh, which I've probably done the last couple of years to my detriment. I've just been playing too much on my own. And as I said, when you play too much on your own, um, you're not sharp enough. So there's been times I've went to a tournament and I've nearly felt like I had to win my first couple of matches to get up to speed or sharpness to, where, to be where I want to be. That's problem A. But problem B is if you play too much on your own, it's if you can effectively uh, do, do your head in. So an example would be you go, you want to work on your long potting. So you practice a shot today and you put it nine out of ten. Brilliant. Yeah, so ideally, if you're playing somebody tomorrow, you'd be quite confident. But if you weren't playing somebody, what, what can happen to me is, certainly by my perfectionist nature, is I think, okay, I got nine out of ten. How did I miss one? And in trying to find that perfection, you go searching where you shouldn't be searching. And all of a sudden now you're back to putting a three or four out of ten. And you've literally, you know, went down the other side of the mountain. So... Uh, you went from a lack of skill or knowledge went to you know basically doing your own head in this stuff so if you had a better balance uh especially if you play a day or two on your own that should be more than enough and then mm -hmm. you go off and play three or four days and i said when you're playing the likes of but to be fair jordan mike michael georgia and particularly um mark Allen and sean murphy the areas on your where you have to work in a game get highlighted so so much because your break off or first safety can be end of frame or if you miss on 60 they, they step in and clear so if you you know so it's certainly going forward the best way to describe it is i probably play for three or four days against people and a day or two of my working on areas for improvement and then play more people so on so on but as i said i'm still very enthusiastic and feel i can play well but my preparation Whilst I've worked hard, I probably haven't worked as smart as I could have. I'm just want to go over to Jordan in a wee second. Just one thing I want to ask you before I leave you there, uh, Fergal. You, uh, I understand that you you, you are practicing. Are you, are you practicing quite a bit with Sean? Has he sharpened you up a bit, or or uh, in that sense? Yeah, yeah. Obviously, he's such he's such a good such a good player. So we we probably in a sense we've different main strengths as such. Obviously, his he's maybe more attacking and uh more attacking uh i'm probably better long part of than me whereas i'd be more uh safety minded and tactical minded so you know i'd probably you're dragging, that one, down, you're dragging that one down aren't you <laughs> Pardon? sean's such a strong potter and a quick yeah, player very good. You know, so, you? 
You could be yeah, destroying that good. man with your very tough match play, you know. Yeah, I said, there's been a little bit of a trade off, but it's been good even sometimes, apart from actually playing him. And obviously, if you play, if you beat Sean in the best of nine, mm. that's a great confidence booster because your game has to be a very high level to beat him. But also, if you lose to him, chances are you still would have learned a couple of things. So sometimes we might be after a game or during a frame, and I might say to him, in a ma- it might be my shot, and I'd say, in a match, should I go for this? Um, would you go for this? If I don't go for this shot, do you do you regard that as a sign of weakness? And for certain shots, he'd say, oh, no, you know, safety is a good option there. Or no, he says, look, I don't care what the score is. You have to be home for that. If you turn down that kind of shot, you're basically saying I'm, I'm lacking in confidence. So pick, picking his brain at certain ideas as well, apart from seeing his, uh, his preparation and also just, just actually watching him strike the cue ball. Yeah. And his technique, yeah. you, you know, yeah. chant, even subconsciously, you probably get a little bit smoother. He's very, uh, Sean is not only a, a great cueist, he's very technical too. He can go in, I mean, yeah. if I had Sean on here, Sean would talk me onto the table. About yeah, yeah. He is, a, he's very technical, he's very, very clever. And by the way, by the way, uh, I spoke to Sean a couple of times when I was with Jordan. In, in some of the practice areas there last and he had nothing but good things to say about you very return compliments mate he enjoys playing with you and you can see your experience and he's actually he actually said to me he's gained some things from you so i mean it's also good to hear now just before we come back to you i want to get over to jordan here before he disappears again you i know? don't mean to although i want to get rid of i know of you don't i know you don't mate it's good to have you on here you know now uh jordy uh you were on a tour only for about a season, nearly 10 years ago. It, yeah. it probably wasn't a very nice experience for you because there wasn't as many uh, events and you were, I don't know, you were sort of thrown in there at the deep end, weren't you really? What are your reflections on that? Well, it really was. A, it was obviously great to turn professional at that time, but it was probably the worst time to turn pro because, as Fergal knows, there was only like six, seven ranking terms to play in and you had like maybe six, seven weeks in between matches. So it, it's not like it is now. I mean, the game is in the best shape it's ever been. But back then, in hindsight, it was maybe a little bit, personally, maybe a wee bit too early for me because I was still maturing as a player. But um, I felt like whenever I turned pro this time around, I feel like I was ready. Yeah, no, that's that's fair enough assessment. That's, that's kind of where I was thinking when I was coming with that question there. So here we are, nearly 10 years later, get yourself through... Q school. I know that you, you know, your amateur game with Patrick was very good. At that I don't think very many of the players were touching you, mate, in the amateur game between that time. But you did try to get back on the tour through Q school. I think uh, a few times there. But you made it. Look, you made it in 2018. This is the end, yeah. virtually the end of your second season back on the tour. I think uh-huh. we all know. We don't have to. We we, we don't need the sort of delve too much into the fact that we know that you have improved and uh, you're a much more mature player because everybody I've spoken to have, has said that. So what what is your uh, what is your reflection? I suppose you could say, just before I ask you this, um, your first season wasn't great. It wasn't great. It probably wasn't expected to be great because you, you got a lot of confidence. For me, you're a confidence-driven player. But what's your reflection on the first and second seasons? Uh, first season, well, I lost my first five matches as a pro, and after all that, I just sort of like reflected on it and just said, right, but what am I doing wrong here? Am I not practicing enough? Am I not doing this and that right? But uh, after that, I started. I remember I went to Germany and I beat Gary Wilson four nil, and all of a sudden, I just felt like, wow, well, I can't actually play this game. You know, it's not like um, I fallen up by, by the way said. And then I just grew from that, you know, beating a player like Gary, you know, just was the start of it. And I started winning a few games, started qualifying for events in China and that. I got off to a slow start, but once I found my feet on the tour, then I just gradually grew in confidence because, as you say, I'm a confidence-driven player, you know. Yeah, very, very, I I think I saw that very clearly. I, I, I could compare maybe another dozen players. I'm not going to mention their names. You know, to you, they're, they're probably perhaps maybe a little bit higher up in the rankings because they've been on the tour a bit longer, but they're the same age as yourself. I think they're confidence-driven too, and I think that 
I, I can't help think that a, a lot of players of your generation, I mean, uh, I think, what are you, are you 32? You're, 30, you're 32 at the moment? 30 years young, yep. yeah. 30, uh, you look a lot older, by the way, but I'm not going to go there, all right? Okay. I'll go there. Well, you know, I don't know what you're smiling about, Fergal. I'm, I'll, I'll touch on your age in a minute. But, uh, <laughs> but, yeah. well, I get away, man. but yes, I think that, you know, having, having sort of looked at your game, and I'm not just particularly sort of focusing on you to that extent because of, I've come to the I've come to some of the some of the tournaments with you and, and, and tried to help you. But you you do it, it does seem to, to be a confidence thing and uh perhaps maybe sometimes there's something going on when you're out there at the venue that you're uh you're just trying to overcome. Because I remember you saying to me that you know if you start winning a few matches you'll gain a lot of confidence and it was a big, big thing big plus big huge thing for you because you started beating very, very good top sixteen players. And then you know, obviously, you know, you, you you can do that, and you can you can go as far as you want to go. So, what else do you think you need to do? Well, as you said, um, I've beaten a few top sixteen players, so I know I feel like I belong there. It's just I haven't pushed on, you know. From you know, I haven't got past the last thirty two of an event. I've just been consistently, as Fergal knows, how important the first matches are in each tournament, you know, because they're the one to get you the points. But if I, uh, if I have had a big win against a big player, then I haven't followed it up, you know. So maybe lacking a wee bit of consistency, which is disappointing. But uh, that's something I'm still trying to work on. Um, it's very tough in the game nowadays, you know, because the standard's so high. But um, the bottom line is, you know, I believe I belong there. And I've just got to keep practicing and working hard, you know. I think at the moment, just touching on the both of you, I think, Fergal, you're obviously provisionally ranked 69, so you're looking to, you know, obviously get a few points. Maybe perhaps, a, you know, a, a, there's there's every there's every reason why the World Championships will be completed, whether it's behind doors or not. You know, it, it looks like it will possibly. So the both of you are sort of hanging on a wee bit there, Jordy. You're, uh, I think, you're provisionally ranked. Is it 70? Is it 74 or? I'm 74, but I'm in the top four currently in the one year. One year. Yeah, one year list. So realistically, that's my best chance of staying on. So, uh, so I'm on borderline, but touch and go. A little bit of pressure on the both of you, really, with all absolutely. this. Yeah, absolutely. Going on around here, you know. Yeah, it's 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 hard to see. The more you actually think about the world championships, it's hard to see it actually maybe being, or you can see problems for being played because, because as we're speaking, Boris Johnson is, you know, a. Uh, laying out like the roadmap as such but if you get to mid-july when the qualifiers are on you're just wondering well apart from even hotels will there be restaurants open practice facilities open and also from what i believe is that anybody that comes into the uk actually with the exception of people from the republic of ireland but anybody that comes into the uk has to quarantine for two weeks right so then right. if you're coming from obviously i think there's nearly 40 players will have to travel to the UK. Mm -hmm. So then if you're due to play, we'd say July 19th for the qualifiers, if you're coming from China or Europe, now you'd have to be in the UK from July 5th, but you'd be quarantined for two weeks. So you're not leaving your hotel room for two weeks. You're not, you're not coming over on the 5th and going to the academy the next day. So instead of coming over two weeks beforehand without any practice, now you've probably to come four weeks over. So you'd have two weeks in England in the UK, in quarantine, in a hotel room, mm. restaurants may or may not be open, there mightn't be any shops, there won't be cinemas open, there won't be shopping centres open. So you have to stay in your hotel room for two weeks, then you have two weeks practice. And as Jordan well knows, if you have two weeks off, it probably takes you the guts of the two weeks to get back to just to where you were. You know, there's no great sense of no great sense of peaking. And me and Jordan with four weeks to go with the world championships, there's no way in a million years we'd say, right. We're four weeks to go. I'll take the first two off. Mm -hmm. So I actually think, so if you have a Chinese player or European player playing somebody from England, in, in the qualifiers, straight off, straight off the bat, that's very unfair because the English mm -hmm. player, now, of course, if he can get into his own club, because Boris Johnson might say clubs, conservative clubs, snooker clubs, sports clubs, might not until August 1st, September, we don't know. But even if the, they are open, an English player can get into his club every day for four weeks and practice as much as he like. 
somebody from and go home for his own dinner. Somebody from China or Europe comes and for those four weeks, he got, well, he either comes for two weeks and doesn't practice, or he comes for four weeks. He's two weeks without practice, and mm -hmm. then he's two weeks literally chasing his tail if he can get into a club. So the guy from England, his four weeks preparation is far, far superior to the, the fellows have to travel. So all of a sudden, that's to me, that seems unfair. And he's been penalized because he doesn't live in yep. the UK. Whereas if we say it's been postponed until September, October, well, then every, by, certainly by August, you would think the UK is up and running. Shops are back open. Restaurants are back up. Now, there's still obviously restrictions, but... You know, I wouldn't fancy, as said, by fortune, because I'm in the Republic of Ireland, I won't have to quarantine, but I wouldn't fancy playing the world qualifier, having to go four weeks in advance, at, which could be over the month would easily be another four or five grand worth of expenses. I've mm -hmm. two weeks stuck in a hotel room, going nowhere because I'm in quarantine. And then when I go to practice, where am I going to practice? There'll be loads mm -hmm. of players there. Can I practice as much as I like? Will there be social distancing? Will they use all the tables? Can I practice with yeah. somebody? How about to play yeah. on my own? And all of a sudden, mm -hmm. you know, I, I just think these dates have become available because mm -hmm. maybe because the Olympics aren't on and BBC are available and they're trying to shoehorn them in. Whereas I think World Snooker said, what is the best for the game that we can more or less guarantee player safety, more or less give them every fair opportunity to prepare? You would play it in September or October. But because this date has come in July and August for the Crucible, and it's the still going to be behind closed doors. Trying to yeah. squeeze it in. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Jordan, what do you think? No, I, I just uh, touched on what Fergal said. You know, whenever you weigh everything up, you know, I just think he just summed it up in one. I just cannot see how it can go on ahead. Obviously, you know, me and Fergal were discussing this yesterday, and. You know, obviously we have to have the mindset of you know preparing for the qualifiers as if they were going on ahead but mm -hmm. realistically i just i just can't see this improving anytime soon you know i'm i think we're talking at least september october time but you know if it does happen well then you know good luck good luck to you ever talking it because they've got a really hard job on their hands as to how they're gonna go about this you know well i think that's but, uh, pretty much summed it up there lads i mean one feral, sorry. Then, yeah, one other factor is depending you hear about like the other sports and the steps they're making. And once it's behind closed doors and there's gonna be no guests or players or sorry, no managers or coaches there, and in theory, you know, you're opposite opposite chairs and there's a referee, and it, but we if you take it to the letter of point, we are still touching the same cloth, the same wood, the yeah. same rest. Yeah. So if if a player has it or it's there, it's going to happen. But also, if at any point in the qualifiers of the Crucible, one player gets the virus, that's the tournament over. Because if, yeah. if one qualifier has it, no qualifiers can go to the Crucible because they have to quarantine as well. And as I, I was also thinking, if you wake up on the morning of your match, mm -hmm. say, for example, me and Jordan, we have to, say, you, I'll use Jordan as an example. Jordan wakes up on this morning to play his match that he has to win to stay on the tour which maintains his career, and he's got one or two symptoms of the virus. The right thing for him to do is go straight to the hospital. If there's no testing at the venue, for I can say, is go to the hospital and get tested. But there's every chance Jordan, like us all, would say, oh, look, I'll probably be okay. He'll go ahead and play his match and put other players and officials' health in jeopardy just because he has to win, because this tournament has to be played, which is a poor decision by Jordan which I totally understand because but the player's safety is paramount. So it's no point we play this World Championships. We get fantastic viewing figures, but a player gets the virus. Mm. Yeah. I think, and, and again, some of the symptoms, I, some I of the symptoms aren't so obvious. I hope we're more concerned. I just hope that common sense prevails because, you know, um, it's all about the players at the end of the day and uh, the safety is paramount. Well, yes, that's that's it, and this is this is one of the reasons why I think, and we're, we're probably like, it's okay to think to think a wee bit ahead and to you know you know think about what's going to happen, but I think I think realistically the the tournament's not going to be it's not going to be held until long after the summer, lads. I really don't think I think it is, and I think by that time there could be possibly be some testing procedure in by then where they can test you. 
before you play the event. And if we, especially, yeah. I mean, if we, ha if, if we have an antibody test by then, that will tell you know that will tell a lot of you whether some of you have had the virus or ha ha had the antibodies. So maybe by that time, which is say what two three months from now, maybe maybe yeah. the, the hopefully there'll be a testing procedure where we'll you know we'll be able to take all that speculation away and concern. Maybe maybe not. What do you and think? Again, it, only, it only takes one player, you know, to just test positive and then the whole tournament's over, you know, and the chances, I know I hate to say it like, but the chances of one player in 128 testing, you know, could be, there could be a chance there because none of us know who has it. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. yep. And again, some of the symptoms, which is worse, you, you might have it, but you don't, the symptoms mightn't be that clear. Yeah. But also, if we take it for argument's sake, um, if the day or two before you're due to travel, say, Jordan's girlfriend or my wife comes home from work and says, oh, the girl I work with, she's actually tested positive for the virus. Then my wife would have to go into, you know, quarantine. Yeah, so yeah, would yeah. I because of my contact. So again, you're putting me in a position where I have to play this match. I have to win. I could fall off the tour. I could make a poor decision based on, look, I could, chances are I don't have it. So I'm going to get on a, say nothing, get on a flight, mix with people, go to, go to practice in a venue, potentially contaminate others just because, again, I have to win it. And it's a poor choice, but the players shouldn't be put in that position. I think if you were, as I said, if I was the chairman of the game, and my number one priority is the safety and welfare of the players, you'd say nothing before September 1st. Well, this is, if, this is, this is, boy, this is where the testing is going to be vital here. I think if, yeah. if, if, if testing... If you got testing... If you get testing, that might change, of course. Yep, that's that's right. I mean, look, this is this is I I, I can't see anything being decided really for at least several months here, in terms of this cup, uh, the, the the worlds. But uh, the thing oh. is, I think, I think it, you can't. I don't think anything's going to happen without testing. I think I don't think any decisions could be made at that level. Anyway, look, we're going to get away from that nonsense for a minute now. I know we have to deal with it. We're going to get try and be a wee bit positive here. We're not sure what's good. going on yet, but um, <laughs> we're just. Uh, like I said, we all we all hope the world championships does go ahead in July, because we all yeah. want to get back practicing. But however, the bigger picture is it might just come a month or two too early for where the UK will be. And and another thing, um, also, but Boris Johnson, as I was said, as I was speaking, the snooker clubs themselves, so even the UK players they might be able to get into their club to practice. Yeah. In the, until maybe July, August. We don't know. You're getting some praise here, Fer. Everybody's agreeing with you here online. <laughs> maybe you should host the show. You know, maybe you should host the show. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> anyway, I want to get back. I want to touch on your careers a wee bit. And um, what I want to do is I want to just, I think just to have a little bit of a reflection I know you've only had a couple of seasons there, Jory, since you've got back on it. And uh, obviously, Fergal, you've been on the tour, you've got your career uh, and what have you. Is there any parts of your games that would you, you you feel you'd like to improve on or you have improved on? Start with you, Fergal. Um, well, I suppose you'd always like to score score heavier. I've had, you know, I've had times where I have scored heavy. And certainly when I've played my best, I have scored heavy. But I suppose if you look at throughout my career, you know, I probably average 10, 15 centuries a season, which is not terrible. But, I mean, if you look at the top players, or top 10, they probably average around 50. So straight up, like, if I ever had a season where I had 50 centuries, you know, you look out. <laughs> I'd probably be winning a couple of tournaments and earning, you know, three, four hundred grand. If you just did those maths, so yes, whilst I do score, can score heavy, I could be scoring heavier more consistently. And I suppose maybe my long potting could be stronger as well. And particularly as the game evolves over the years, uh, there's people are going for more long pots. You, you don't want you don't want to be seen to refuse in shots that, as I said, your opponent thinks you should be going for and showing a sight and a weakness. But it's not enough just to go for it. You then need to go for it and get it. And also, once you've got it, then score. Because there's no point making a 
getting a great long pot being in and missing on 40 because you might as well miss the long pot in the first place because your opponent's going to, chances are, step in. And particularly over the years, as a big difference between the first 15 years of my career and the next 15 is the first round or two are far harder. So right from the first go, you've got to be on it. And if you're not, you lose. And you could lose quite quite easily. Whereas there was years, maybe yeah. I was in the top, even in the top 16, the first match or two wasn't too bad. And you could maybe nurse your way into the term the little piece, but you certainly can't do that nowadays. Well, you're a... Uh... I mean, I, I see you as a tough match player. I, I'm, I'm not sure a lot of a lot of um, seasoned professionals or, or players who've been on the tour really probably enjoy playing you because you are. I mean, you are a tough, gritty match player. You don't give up. You've got a pretty good, pretty good demeanor really on the table. You 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 don't show emotion that much, and you don't give up either. And I think that yeah. I don't think players like that. Now you may perhaps think you know maybe I, I want to score a lot heavier, but at the same time you you wait for your opportunities. Is is that the type of player you are? Is that as I mean, hi, I'm expressing you here. Is that? Yeah, that, 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 I suppose. I suppose in boxing terms, in boxing terms, I don't have that one massive knockout punch that's going to just floor you. I'd be more over the twelve rounds distance. I win on points because during the match, I can probably go with the ebb and flow of matches and stay the distance and not give in and wear them down yeah. and through discipline and hard work, stay the distance up. I'd be very rare in matches. I've effectively beaten myself up. So I'd stay the distance. And when it, get, when it goes to the distance, I win on points. That's probably a, a slight generalization, but that's kind of a feeling in a match. Even if I'm not playing my very best, I can still maybe outwork them, maybe find a way to win. Even if I'm not at my best, but that's probably probably a fair description, as you just as you said it did. Tough player. Was it you? Uh, I'm not sure about this, Fergal. Is it you that actually has the longest frame in history? <laughs> yes. One or, or, or two I'm people not, have I, mentioned that to me. Somebody just sent me a message there. Uh, Fergal had the longest frame. <laughs> Is that I, right? I never heard about it. Plan, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Jordy, I'll switch over to you. Uh, uh, well, my strength is always, has always been my scoring. Um, I always play well in practice, but we all want to take the practice game to the match arena. Um, I feel like I don't do that enough, and my scoring would let me down at times. But even if I'm not playing well, you know, I, I feel like I have a good B game. I can always play good safety and just hug and poke a wee bit. But the, nowadays you've got a score and um, basically what I was saying earlier, I feel like I need to improve that, you know, in order to keep progressing up the rankings. Absolutely. I think I think this season, what there is of it, what you could have done, I think you've proved a lot by beating some very good top 16 players. Yeah, yeah. You know, you had a couple of... You had a couple of good matches, which I had a little look at, actually. I think it was your two matches against Dave Gilbert. Mm -hmm. I thought I thought you proved a lot there to yourself, personally. I, I thought you I thought you showed a lot of strength there. I think I think Dave Dave I think I think Dave Gil Gilbert probably lost a bit of confidence really after the first match on that one because he's a he's a he's a very talented he's a very very talented player. Very good match player. Bit him very highly. Um, he's obviously shot his way up to the top sixteen, and feel like he belongs there because I think I think his game is definitely top sixteen material. I think he's going to be there for many years. Um, so to get um, well, I beat him twice within five days. So it was definitely um, a confidence booster, all right. But I just I lost my next two qualifiers because they're the only two events that you could have to win two qualifiers to go to where was it the European Masters and the German Masters. Uh, and I lost my next match in, in both of them, so it's it was just disappointing, you know, that I didn't follow it up. But like like I, like you said, you know, to get two wins in one week against him was uh, definitely uh, fell out of my cap. And does this? I, I mean, look, I, I I see you two lads, and I I see I see I do actually see two very different types of game. You know, uh, I think. You know, Jordy, you're you're a good long potter. You're a break builder, confidence driven. You know, Fergal, you've been on the tour so many years. You're a very tough player, very very good, 
very strong, very intelligent match player. Perhaps waits for his chances. Perhaps maybe doesn't score as well as you'd like to all the time. And, and as, as much in that respect, maybe you've been on the tour all those years and maybe you feel you could, you could have done a lot better. Do you think that that, that affects your game? There, do you, does, it, does that bother you a little bit, the both of you? I mean, Fergal, maybe knowing that you have to work really hard and maybe sometimes dig, dig really deep to get where you want to get. And maybe, Jordan, maybe no. perhaps on your side you make a few mistakes, Fergal? So, no, it never, it never bothers me having to work hard, whether that's during the preparation, whether that's putting in the six hours a day or traveling to the UK or traveling up to Antrim to, to do the best preparation I feel. Or during the match so that's no issue at all if you say to me you're going to go to play a match it's going to be five four and it's going to take four hours but you win happy days i'll take it i'll take it now but yeah. obviously yeah. look people probably say yeah that's typical but obviously like everybody i want to win five nil with five big breaks but i've never i've never played well as far as i can remember never really played a match and thought say i might be three one down at the interval and struggling and poor and thought, well, I'm not playing well enough to hear to, to win here. It's not my day. I've never thought that. I feel I can find a way to win, um, but it's greater concentration, greater discipline, playing more positive, playing more attacking. I feel I can. And of course, even if you make that three, two, three all. So there've been plenty of matches, and even if you go back to the British Open, that if you talk about that, that I won. But I mean, there was two or three matches I played, and if you watched it, it was it wasn't pretty. You know, and I never looked like the tournament winner, but I kept winning. And if I win today, I give myself a chance to win tomorrow. And I said, you you, you beat Ronnie O'Sullivan on TV. And you beat him 5-2 and you look fantastic. People don't probably realize the day before, I've probably beaten some player ranked 85, 5-4, and just found a way to win. But because as so long as I stay in the tournament, I yeah. can improve. I'll give yeah. myself a chance to prove. But like everybody, everybody wants to play really well. And score heavier, be more attacking. But snoop, that's that's called snooker. And the sooner you accept that, the, that that's been one of my assets that I haven't been too hard on myself if I haven't been playing brilliant or good. Just get the job done today, give myself a chance. Yeah, it's um, similar to what Fergal's saying there. I think um, we all take pride in performance, you know, and we all want, we're in an entertainment sport. You know, it's nice to entertain as well, but us as players, the number one priority is to win. And it, it doesn't matter how you win, it's just as long as you win, you know, because wins are hard to come by these days, as Fergal knows. And, uh, you know, it's it's just getting the job done, as Fergal says, yeah. So, I mean, uh, just touching on something that you mentioned to begin with there, Fergal, when you said you, you, you felt as if you were playing playing on your own there at the beginning of the beginning of the interview obviously Sean yeah. I know Sean's come over quite recently there last year and or, or this year actually I think he's come over on the table do you do you, would you prefer to play a lot of solo or would you prefer to mix it up well that's what I'm saying the I have been playing too much on my solo too, sorry too much solo and again some of that has been by choice but as I said over the last 10 year period, with the exception of Ken Doherty, of course, and, and Sean the last year or two, the people I generally practice with apart from Ken, Michael Judge, Joe Delaney, Patrick Wallace, Joe Swell, Colin Gilchrist, Davy Morris, Brendan O'Donoghue, David Hogan, they are all gone. So if right. I want a game, it's either Ken or Sean. And for many years, for many years, there might have been just Ken. So I might decide, well, I'll play with Ken a couple of days before I go away. But, of course, Ken might have had other plans of preparing differently. So the plan I had of playing people four days and then a day on my own didn't work out. Before. There wasn't people there or they had other plans. So you've gone away with a tournament and haven't prepared the way I want. Whereas the, the, the lovely thing about going up to Antrim is I turn up there and I'm, for a three, four day period, I'm guaranteed in one day I can have a, which I've done, I have a best of nine with Mark, Jordan and Michael Giorgio. Mm -hmm. Or I can play them all day, three days in a row. Four, and, I, and then if I come, if I have four days up in Antrim and then have a day on my own on Friday, even if I take the weekends off, yeah. my game's, my game's yeah. going to be sharp. And even if it's not sharp, my practice on my own is going to be very good because I've been identified. Because if I go up to Antrum, to play Jordan, to play Michael, to play Mark, I've got to be honest. 
I'm going to be on it from the get-go and all day, which is brilliant, which is where I want to be. So in doing that, and even felt in Gibraltar, by having a few weeks of doing, and to be fair, the first time or two I went up, apart from Mark maybe giving me a hammer in, Jordan and Michael were probably beating me as well. Mm -hmm. So I feel the last time or two have been more competitive, would we say. And I felt in Gibraltar, I played a lot better, a lot sharper, and scored a lot heavier, which is a byproduct of, if I'm sharp, I'm going to score heavy. You, can't, you don't go into a match saying, really, I'm going to score heavy today. You're a byproduct of your preparation by playing those really good players and sharpening up, which yeah, forces yeah. you to play yeah, better. Yeah. That then I brought that to a tournament. So what Jordan and Michael and Mark have up in Antrim is fantastic. So if the world goes ahead in July, the two weeks beforehand, if I'm allowed to travel across the border more than 50 kilometers, I'll be up there for two weeks trying to battle with those boys every day to get my game as best as I can, to prepare as best as I can. No, you have some very good, before I come to you, Jordy, uh, very, very good points there, Fergal. Fantastic. Um, I'm quite... I feel quite inspired actually to have you on here, but, but you've um, you uh, you, know, you would stay a couple of nights, perhaps maybe stay a couple of nights in Antrim, you know. But this is one of the things that I, I, I've been saying to a lot of young players like Jordan, and uh, it's just to encourage you know the the new professionals on the tour if they don't get past those qualifying rounds, travel and play as many different players as you can. Because all it does is strengthen your game. So, I mean, I, I, you know, you could say, Jordy, I probably encouraged you a bit too much, you know, to play in the pro arms to sharpen yourself up a wee bit. And some of these lads, some of the wee lads in conditions probably were, you know, the conditions of the tables are not quite right. But coming over yeah. and playing other professionals like Jimmy and Mark, you know, yeah. you, I know you've been coming over playing with, uh, with Jimmy Robertson and that there. But, but if you're not winning those first round matches, very important to keep traveling and keep playing. George, Jordan. Yeah, um, well, obviously traveling is part and parcel of the professional game. And like you said, Dave, uh, you've had me over playing in your pro arms, which is great. And I've managed to sneak in a bit of practice with uh, Jimmy Robertson and Mark Davis, which is invaluable, really, because it's a change of scenery as well. You know, instead of, you know, I'm not saying that the... The, the obviously the, it's perfect practice conditions in the club I'm in, but it's nice to get away the different places I've been down with Fergal a couple of times and I've travelled over to, to England to play different players, you know, it's, it's nice to, you know, because you're playing on different tables as well and you're playing different style of players as well, you know so it's only going to benefit your game mm -hmm. And do you think it has? Do you think it's sharpened you up? Yeah, I mean absolutely. Absolutely, because whenever I started, you know, traveling over, you know, playing, like I said, Jimmy and Mark, um, you know, my, my results have improved, you know, over the course of the two seasons, um, getting off the slow start and then I sort of changed it a wee bit and mixed it up and playing and playing different players and stuff. So, yeah, it was, it was all good in the end. And perhaps even... Mark, go ahead, mate. Sorry. If I just think about Jordan, in the last two years, I'd say Jordan... And he was a very good player before, but Jordan's game has improved at least 14 points in the last two years, guaranteed. I've seen it from practicing with him. But and beforehand, if we take before two, I'm sure he worked as hard. He he wasn't really, uh, you know, he always worked hard. But it's not just the work he's putting in the hours; it's the quality of. And if day in day out he's playing Mark Allen, and now as a bonus the last year or so he's up Michael Giorgio. But I mean. You can you can break off three times against Mark Allen and lose five nil, like yeah, like that. And he played another set, and he beat you five one. And he, he might have had one visit for for the day. And he could. I went up there and I've come on after losing fifteen three, and you're probably like, well, I only won three frames. I probably only could have won three or four of the other ones. So yes. as a result of that, you become so much more sharper. So the next time you go up to play Mark Allen. On your way, on your way up in the car, you're thinking, "I've got to on it today." From the break off, you know you can't afford a break off because that would be the frame over. If you miss a long pot and let him in, that's the frame over. If you if you're in and miss, if you miss on forty, so why is Mark Allen so good? I think he's very dull. I see he's put. Oh, he's dull. <laughs> I see his, his commentary. He's, he's got a lot of Z. He's watching this, boys. You know. 
there's nothing exciting about Mark Allen. He's just, he's up there. He's at the top, you know, and uh, sooner or later, boys, you'll catch up with him. Don't worry about it. Sorry. As I said, Jordan, Jordan having the chance to practice with Mark every day and uh, Michael yeah. George is the reason why he's improved over the last two years because day in, day out, he's preparing very well. So is it worth, Jordan, is it worth you maybe perhaps going down to Dublin or uh, play some of the Irish lads, some of the other Irish lads there? Is it worth you? I mean, it's, what, it's, I can't remember how long it takes. I think it takes a couple of hours, doesn't it? But <laughs> is it something that you would, I mean, look, you've got Michael. Michael has arrived in Antrim, probably one of the best decisions Michael's made in a long time. The Antrim Club's a great club. As you say, you can't you can't get better practice partners than Mark, you know. And even if you can mix it up, a Fergal can come up for a couple of days. I mean, even if you can go down and play Ken, Fergal, and maybe Sean, sharpen you up a little bit. It's all getting very nice and cozy there. Do you not think so? Have you frozen up, or is it me? Well, no, you were talking to Jordan. I think I think Jordan's frozen up. But uh, I, to be fair to Jordan, Jordan has come down. Jordan has come down a few times to me, and um, we've had a, you know he, he'd come down for lunchtime. We'd have two or three best of nines. He stays over, and we play all day the next day, and then he goes home. So to be fair, go back a few years. Jordan has come down to me to practice. Well, I I, I think it's nothing but good. I think that I think that, that has been one of the reasons why maybe perhaps players like Jordan. Uh, haven't been as maybe it's, it's probably one of the reasons why you know Jordy it's probably one of the reasons why you haven't been perhaps maybe more consistent especially in the first season you know there because Sorry, of, off there, Dave. no that's okay mate can you hear me all right yeah yeah just just the wi-fi went off there just yeah no you haven't missed much Fergal was talking to me so you didn't miss oh. much but uh, <laughs> talking covers as usual. <laughs> he was he was talking about his ducks in the garden, so it was all right. Don't worry about it. But all no, right. no, we're just touching on um, traveling and playing when you're not competitive, when you're not, when you don't get the opportunity to get to the to play in those second round matches. I think there's a very, I think there's a very nice thing going on there in Antrim with you all, and I think that uh, it'll do nothing other than sharp sharpen you up a bit. For you yeah. personally, I think it was just lack of matches, and uh, the first season, you know, because you, you you struggled to win so many of your matches in the first season. Yeah, but you've proved this season in the one year list, so you've you've toughened yourself up in that respect. Right, I'm just want to get through a couple of wee questions here, lads, because as usual, as usual, Fer Fergal's been talking so much, he's taken up he's taken up half the whole show, you know. <laughs> I can't get a word out of it. <laughs> anyway, right, so a couple of weeks. These are general questions which I've mapped out because they're quite important. A lot of the guys on here are generally asked the same questions over and over again. So in terms of uh, formats and things like that, if I was to say best of sevens or best of nines, what would be your response? Nine. Um. I think uh, Fergal will touch on this. Um, if he remembers the European Masters qualifiers, would best of nine, well, first of all, I prefer best of nines all day, but we had best of nine with no interval, and I don't think there was one match that was lagging behind or anything like that there. I think everyone was in the time slot. So I think the way forward is best of nines with no interval, yeah. you know, but... Um, yeah. I think the best of sevens, uh, you can have some events still best of sevens, like at Home Nations, but I think more best of nines is the way forward. And I think yeah. most of them will agree. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah, absolutely. As I said, it made no impact at all, really, playing the be that best of nine without an interval. So I've no issue at all of going forward. I prefer, I prefer play a best of nine, even if it means there's no interval, than a best of seven. That's the general view of most. Most of the tour players, I always like to put this in because it's it's good it's good feedback for World Snooker. You know the I'm not sure they get it quite accurate as all of those. Right, let's touch on uh, tables, cues, and tips. Uh, Fergal, what cue do you play with? What kind of tip you got on there? Uh, it's a John Paris cue. I've had it since 2001. It's a 10 millimeter at the top, but as most people know, I've been 
11 millimeter tip on top of it, which which obviously overlaps. So um, it bamboozles some players' minds when they see it because it's overlapping. But if my if I had a 10 millimeter tip on a 10 millimeter ferrule and it was flush, that that blows my mind. That effectively, that nearly makes me like blind as such. Whereas I like to see the the piece overhanging, but it wouldn't be for everybody. <laughs> Do you not get a little bit of fertile? Do you not get a little bit of dust on your tip? No, like a little cobweb or something. You know, it takes you so long to play a shot. I thought maybe, maybe you'd have to give it away. Right. You're allowed you're allowed one dig. Now, now you've had it, now move on. <laughs> <laughs> what type of what type of tips you got on there? What type of tips you use, Fertile? I've always used the same Elk Master 11 millimeter. Never changed. Jory, what Q and tips and whatever I have, what have you? Uh, well, I've used a Master Q uh, Pro Putt for the last eight years. And um, last season, I actually was tinkering my Qs. I phoned up John Paris uh, to make me a Q, uh, what I wanted, because basically my head was in the bin. I thought it was the Q's fault. But in reality, it was, as Fergal would say, you know, everybody's head, head goes in the bin at times. Um, so I've used that for the last eight years and I've, and I've stuck with it. Uh, and I use Elk Master. I prefer the hard tips rather than I was used to use soft tips, but I felt like I was miscuing a lot more. So I prefer the hard tips now. Interesting. Very, very interesting. Now, guys, I'm going to ask you a question which I've asked some of the other professionals, and I've had some very, very interesting answers. You know, especially off uh, Perry and Holty last week, you know, when I asked them this. But I'm going to ask you both. And the question is, who do you both think is the biggest underachiever in the tour? Now, this could be in terms of maybe anything for any reason. Fergal? Oh, that's a good question. Um, maybe, maybe I thought Stephen Maguire would have done, would have done more. Exactly, he was in my head as well. That's who was but again... You know, I'm I'm aware I'm aware that I've won one ranking event and I'm criticizing him and he's won seven or eight ranking event. But I know when I, I used to go to Sterling when I was with the Indoil Management Group, I used to go to Sterling. So when he first came on the scene at 16, even before he turned pro, I practiced with him a couple of days, and he just looked like fantastic. And I suppose to be fair, when he won the UK Championship that time in 2004, he looked like a, fu a future world champion, a future multiple world champion. Again, we don't know. He may still win, but and he has that by any stretch. He's had a very successful career, but I think mm. he was mm. one that you thought would probably definitely win a, a world title or more or more titles, and and he, uh, he hasn't. Interesting, Jordan. Yeah. Um, similar, um, Stephen McGuire, um, good tour friend. Uh, I've known him many years and know his game. Uh, just think. He, he should have done a lot more. I think once he won that uh, UK title, I thought he was honestly going to dominate. But I think uh, even about himself, at least, he, he lets his temperament get the better of him. Um, another player, um, I know he's achieved quite a lot, but it's actually my good mate, Mark Allen. I think he um, I think, I think he should have won a lot more by now because of his talent. But he's, it's just unfortunate in this day and age that there's... You've got likes here, Ronnie, your Higgins, your Selby's, your Robertsons around that have maybe stopped them winning titles because he's definitely capable of winning a lot more. And he and he and he will, and he will in time. So he will. I think I think he's well capable. It's in, it's inter interesting that you both mentioned Maguire because both uh, Joe Parry and Michael Holt mentioned Maguire uh, uh, yeah. as uh, as an underachiever. Along, of course, with Matthew Stevens. Another you know, person I mentioned, um, I think, is underachieved in recent times, Jack Wazowski. I think for his talent and uh, his cue action and the way he goes about his business, he can be a bit reckless at times, but I think I think he's, he maybe could have done a wee bit more in recent times. Um, oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. I don't know how you feel about Wazowski there, Fergal, but I'm I think sure Wazowski... I yeah. couldn't understand why Lazowski didn't come through quicker in the last sort of five, six years, but yeah. I think he's matured. I think, yeah, I think he should have maybe done something years ago, you know, but only now he's starting to find his feet in the top 16. 
Um, but I think he's. I think it's just took him a wee while just to settle in. Yeah, I agree. I remember years about six or seven years ago having a, a chat with uh, Andrew Higginson out in China, and he actually asked me the question regarding you know he said Anthony McGill or Jack Lazowski, and the way I answered was I think McGill's going to be a great player, but I think I think Lazowski's going to be a superstar. Yeah, and that's that never materialised. I thought I thought Lazowski would win more, but also with the exception probably of Ronnie, so his his manner, the way even if he just the way he falls on the shot and plays, it looks the most simple, the most natural, the most easy on the eye. So not only did you think he was going to win, but he win with style. But as I said, he said, yeah, you know, winning with style is for down the road. He he needs to win and be more consistent. But to be fair to him, he seems the last year or two have worked, been working on it harder. And he's knocking on the door. And certainly, you could, if you were taking a bet, you would say yes that Jack Lazowski will win a ranking event next season. But he hasn't. He's, he's still he's still plenty of time. And again, uh, as the career people's careers are getting longer, so we don't know what the next 10, 15 years may bring for Jack. It could be his thirties. He he starts to bloom. But you would have thought he would have won one by now, and maybe a couple, and been you know one of the big stars of the game. I know he's uh, perhaps uh, Judd at the minute, which is definitely going to um, uh, stand him a good stead, you know, going forward. Um, I, just, I just think he's a fantastic player to watch as well. Let's just touch on those boys at the minute. Why is Ronnie and Judd as good as they are? Why are they so good? Why? What have they got that nobody else has? They've got a gift. <laughs> They've got a natural is it because, board. Is it because they're hitting the centre of the weight ball better than anybody else? Or, or because they're like these machines in their brains and they just like tear people apart and everybody's, everybody's scared of them because they're so good? Why? Why are they so good? Fergal. Well, firstly, with regard to Judd Trump, that's certainly not a technique, a technique that you would in any way copy or advise or teach. But I think a great a great part of that reason, look, they've obviously undoubted talent, but I think because they started so young is a massive is a massive difference. And again, if you read if you read these kind of books where they say to be excellent at anything, you need to have ten thousand hours of practice. If Ronnie O'Sullivan started and Judd Trump started playing at eight, by the time they're sixteen, seventeen, they already in fact have their ten thousand hours clock clocked in as such. Whereas if you start to play 13, 14, 15, and don't play as much because you're still in school, by the time you play 10,000 hours, you know, you're maybe 23, 24. So you would argue they've already got a bit of a jump on you a few years, apart from their talent. And then if they continue also working hard. So that that that's probably why they had so much success so early. And like Tiger Woods being a classic example of used golf, having success so early, just breeds success and winning becomes a habit and the greater expectancy and greater demands and pr providing they keep working hard, you know, just snowballs effects. You know, they're coming, they're coming in with great games, used to winning, fearsome reputations, backing it up with great practice, uh, working hard, winning more tournaments. You know, th that, that's probably a great start. So by the time they were 16, they were brilliant and obviously just continue working hard. Like Joe didn't have all the answers, and it's taken him a while to become the player we thought he could and would become. Years, that? Like, yeah. As a starting yeah. base, you know, they're playing so young so early is certainly an advantage. Great players, they need to work on their personalities a little bit, but you know, probably the <laughs> most exciting players to watch. Jordy, Ronnie, Judd, what is it? What is it about them? What is it? Well, obviously, we all know that Ronnie's the most naturally gifted player we've ever seen. Um, people say that he doesn't practice, but he can fool anybody. He, he practices, trust me. Um, well, wasn't he got like 120 tables all over the UK? Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> um, well, obviously, Ronnie, Ronnie's Ronnie, and he's just he's just great, and he's he's worked hard in his game over the years, but he's back backed up his natural talent. Um, became the greatest player to ever lived. Um, 
with Judd, it, like Fergal said, it took him a good few years to find his feet in the tour. Um, I think um, I think he'll admit himself that he was maybe doing the, uh, going to Vegas a little bit too much. Um, instead of practicing, he was going on a wee holiday here and there. But the last few years, he's he's really knuckled down, and he's got his brother Jack on board, and I think that's really uh, uh, changed changed um, all his well, his career, you know, because he's just he's dominating, you know, and he's he's the one to beat in my opinion. There, um, he's he's just such a great player, yeah. I've asked some of the players this in the past. I mean, what's it like? I mean, I'm not sure. I know you've played Ronnie, uh, Fergal. I mean, yeah. what's? I, I mean, this is this goes for Trump too. By the way, I know you've played Trump there, Jordy, just a few months ago. Yeah. So he, I mean, they must be very intimidating to play against. They must be. Funny enough. What, I, what I'm about to say will probably surprise you, but I always I always felt us, playing O'Sullivan is the easiest match to play mentally because you don't there's no second guessing or planning. It's like going out to run against Usain Bolt. The gun goes, you have to run as fast as you can from the gun to the tape. And it's similar with you play O'Sullivan. Your safety has to be excellent. Your long potting has to be excellent. And when you're, when you're in, you can't miss. So it's, I've always found it easy to play because the task is so clear. clear yeah, but you need to start easy. well. And even if you start well and you're 3-1 up, you need to continue going because it could turn in any stage. So I've always enjoyed playing him. Plus, if you are getting beaten by him, he's still so nice and attractive to watch. But, you know, I've always enjoyed playing him because it's so... If you're playing somebody maybe lower ranked, you can uh, overthink how you play or tactics, whereas O'Sullivan is just simple. I could see Fergal. I could see you torturing Ronnie on the table. He, you know, have about half an hour. You, he'd want to shake your hand. Anyway, touching, uh, touching on guns. Every time I watch you live, I feel like getting my guns out. <laughs> anyway, Jordy, let's get over to you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, what do you want to ask me, Dave? Intimidation. The intimidation of Trump and O'Sullivan. Well, I've I've only played uh, Trump. I've never played Ronnie. Um, yeah. Whenever I played him, obviously, well, he it was his first match as world champion. I played him out in China. Um, I wasn't so much intimidated. I just knew what they expect, you know. But it was interesting to see how he would cope his first match being world champion, mm -hmm. and he just kind of picked up from where he left off. He he played amazing against John Higgins in the final. Of the world, um, his first match against me. I think he started off with two centuries. Um, it can be intimidating if you let it get to you, but the you know what they expect from players like that, and you've you just know, as Fergal says, you from ball one, you've just got to be on it. You know, you've got to score, you know, you can't afford to miss. Um, so yeah, look, listen, these guys are good, right? We got a combination question here it's the question that's just come in on the screen um this is something i was going to ask you anyway the chinese guys are coming in they're very talented some of the young chinese guys are really really talented okay they're coming in from the far east they're coming in thick and fast they're taking over the academies all over the uk <laughs> and how long is it going to take before they win the world championship and who's it going to be and when well, if I, I still don't. It won't. It won't be even in the next five years, anyway. I don't think. I don't With think the so. Possible, possible exception, maybe of Bing Tao, because he has his game. Well, he's still so young. His game is a bit more polished. He's more of an all-round game that you could see. His game is a bit more suited to maybe, you know, going the full seventeen days. But I just don't see in anybody in the next five years from China, for argument's sake, beating Trump in the quarters, Ronnie in the semi. And Selby in the final to use an analogy. There's a couple of uh, Sing Tong and a couple of those young guys. Certainly within ten years, I could definitely see them. They're so they're so talented, but still so raw. And similar to Trump, it might take them a little bit longer to get all the pieces of the, the jigsaw in place. But um, you know, there is plenty of them. But I haven't seen any of them. I, I, I've seen a couple. I think could be world champion. 
with the exception of Ding, there hasn't been a player from China, I said, I'd, I'd take a bet on he will become world champion. There's been plenty of them, but not so many superstars out of, despite the, the numbers. But again, that may well change in the next 10 years or so. Jordy? I think with Ding, obviously he's the benchmark. Um, I think he's just maybe got a wee bit too much weight in his shoulders. With the... Has he lost it? What's happened to Ding? Where has he gone? I think he's got way too much money. I just think uh, sometimes he loses interest very easy. Um, so I just I can't see um, anybody in the next few years, maybe from the Chinese end, being world champion. I know that a couple of players who stand out for me who are well capable of maybe doing it in the future. Um, Fergal just mentioned one, Zin Tong. Uh, I think he's got a great natural ability. Um, but I think the one that's pressed me the most is uh, your wee man Yu Long. I think he's got a very good all round game. I think it's very polished. I think he goes about the table very well. Looks like he knows what he's doing. So I just, um, yeah, but there's so many in there. There's so many that are capable. But it's hard. Whenever you ask world champion material, I can't see it at the minute. It's in the next few years anyway. Look, I want to get some of the Irish lads through. You know, I want to see some proper, you know, look, we've got some good young Irish men coming through. You know, I think from both both sides of the border, not going yeah. to be funny here or anything. You know, there's a there's a lot of talent out there and it needs to get on the tour. You know, we've got Aaron Hill, we've got Ross, we've got we Robbie, Robbie McGuigan. Yeah, through. If, if, I, if you're making a prediction of... Robbie McGuigan is a guy I look at and go, that guy can and will win the world champions. Yeah, 100%, because I'm lucky that, I, that he, 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 Look, I, he's, still very, he's still very young and only time will tell, but that, that kid is special. He's got a yeah. great, great game, great temperament, but also the fact that, obviously, his relationship with Mark, his learning time will be reduced because Mark will be giving him so much advice. So everybody else, a lot of young players will have to make mistakes and learn from them. There's a lot of, probably 50% of the make the mistakes players make, he won't make because Mark, having made it himself, will be able to advise him. So I think in time, he looks a without without trying to put pressure on him, but he looks a fantastic prospect, super player. And he's yeah. only 15. Yeah. And what will he be like, all things being, what will he be like a 10 year, I'm not saying it, within 10 years he'll win the Worlds, but if he keeps going, him at 25, savage player. Savage. Yeah. I was just going to say, I'm very lucky that um, we've, I saw, started to see him club facilities as him and I've seen him develop over the last few years. I think he's been coming into the club since he was nine. And amazingly enough, I know he's got um, Mark as a stepfather, you know, to mentor him. But I think Mark will admit himself that um, Robbie just done it all himself. It was all self self taught. He just picked up the game so quickly, and I think he's well, the way he goes about the table. It shows that he's just developed a natural ability, you know, natural hand eye coordination. Um, mm -hmm. So I think um, he's definitely well capable of. Uh, he's got a very bright future. That's for sure. Yeah, very good words there for Robbie. I, I don't know whether he's watching or not, but. Also I also think as well, um, Aaron Hill and Ross Bullman from the both from Cork, they they're two Aaron. fine players as well. I can see them being, you know, again, you look at future world champ Jay, you look at them, and you could I could see them having careers for the next 20, 30 years. The two of them are very good as well. Very, very impressive indeed, yeah. I think you know that that's that's lads, I'll be absolutely honest with you. I, I don't watch a lot of live snooker. You know, and because I, I'm, I struggle with it a wee bit, but uh, I do watch a lot of I watch a lot of the kids coming through, and when I run the competitions, it's always a pleasure to see the young lads coming down and getting involved in the competitions. I mean, uh, yeah, I think it's very important that they give the, they get the opportunity. Like if the three of them there were in the shootout, you know, that's massive experience for them. You know. If, they don't learn something from that, you know, there's there's something seriously wrong. You know, just no matter what happens, just enjoy it, you know, and they've sampled a bit of the atmosphere and it's I think that's very important. Um they know what they expect the next time, you know. Mm. 
I think there's a lot of talent there, you know, and I think finances stop them from doing what they want to do too, boys. You know, I had a wee, I shot a wee video with Aaron Hill there at the Pro-Am last year. It's, it's on the YouTube channel if anybody wants to take a look at it, you know. But, you know, yeah. it, it's, very, it's very clear that it, uh, he, he needs, you know, he does need, a lot of these young players need support. They need, they need support, and if they get the support, then they can go and play on the Challenge Tour. Takes the pressure, they, off, you know, because the expenses yeah. are a big factor. You know, you need you need the right people around you, and you need people with money, you know, because it's just so expensive nowadays, you know, to fulfill your dream. That's where I think, you know, maybe Barry Hearn's going wrong. I know he won't change, you know, money for first-round losers or anything like there, but I think... Barry you know, won't. I think that's stop, stopping people from playing at their best, you know, because they're always under pressure to make a living, you know, which it's 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 all ahead of these young players, you know, in the future, you know, and I think that needs to that a bit more. Well, that's why I encourage them to, to come and play in the back-to-back -back pro arms as amateurs because it, it does test their nerves. They need to be tested under pressure, and traveling is a big part of what you guys do. It's very, very big. Yes. Psychological effects that it has on you is when you go to the venue and, and dealing with Fergal, you know this all too well. You know, you could write a book about it because you've been on the tour for 30 years, for, for goodness sake. You know, right, boys, yes. I'm going to finish off with one last question because we've run over time. And and by the way, this this has been very quick. They always go very quick, and uh, both of you has, has, has put a lot of a, a lot of information on here. So I hope that. This is, this is the other reason why we do these videos. We do it for the players. We do it for the young players so they can look back and have a little listen and, and listen to players who have just come on the tour even uh, if or who have been on the tour for a very long time get a little bit of an insight into the characters. They don't have to be exciting. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I never mean, thought I was going to touch on there, you know, but well, they, yeah. they have a lot of different areas in their game of expertise. And I think if some of the young guys were to actually stop and listen, just listen, you know, and pay attention, then they can maybe develop a little bit of a uh, little bit of control over their game, you know. Anyway, we're going to finish off with this. I ask this as a general, you know, I'm not going to get too much detailed into this. We've got 128 professionals on the tour, okay? Now there there has there is mixed feelings about this about a lot of the lower ranked professionals, especially especially young players just getting on the tour, about the seating. Okay. So now everybody everybody goes in that 128. Now I personally don't think it's fair. I don't think it's working. And I don't think it's working because if you look at the 32, the bottom 32 out of that 128, they're they're not making any money at all. Yeah, so awesome. when, you, when you look when you look at that structure, lads, I see a problem. And the only reason why I see a problem is because I see a bunch of players down there. All right, it may only be a, a a third of them, but the thing is that uh, they're not making any money, and it's a problem that needs to be fixed. So is this a seeding problem? How do we fix that, or is it a problem, Virgil? I would know. I don't overly think it's a problem as such. I understand. Yeah, um, there's probably there's probably more events they could maybe have where obviously you, you know if you're a young using Aaron Hill as example, if he's on the tour next year in his first three or four terms, he plays Selby, Ding, Trump, and Robertson. You know, chances of him winning any matches is is very slim. But that that's slightly depending on the look of the draw. You know, there'll be other matches where he'll play in and around. So maybe there could be a tournament or two where, you know, like the old days, there was a couple of rounds. So Aaron Hill might play one or two matches before he plays in a top 64, top third, maybe one or two of those. But if the rankings are over two years, so if, if over two years you play 35 tournaments, you can't really say, oh, I've got really bad draws over 35 events. And again, well, it might be an exception. If you plunked Ronnie O'Sullivan into this system, he'd get through. Ronnie O'Sullivan came through. There were 700 players. He'd play, he had to win 74 matches in 76 days just to make the top 100. He did it. If you're good enough, ultimately you're going to come through. And it's not 
over the two years, you're going to get enough opportunity. Now, I know, I, I know I'm not making it sound easy because I know it is difficult, but I think if over two seasons you have 30-odd tournaments, you can't always be getting bad draws. And again, yeah. The, the, yeah. the cream of the crop would have come through. You give any system you like to an O'Sullivan, a Higgins, a Williams, they would have come through. Now, I know you want more people coming through and you want it as fair as possible. So maybe a few tournaments could be as we... And prefer the World Championships, if it goes ahead this year, there is those... There is a... You know, there's four matches... Uh, round one, you have four matches to qualify, whereas the last year has been three. So they'll play... They'll, they'll have a first round, a second, and then they'll play a top a top 64 player. So that, in some events, that'll be fairer. And it's a valid point, but not, not, not enough to... Not enough of an excuse over two years. But if you're going to, if you're good enough, you'd come through. Jory, I actually have to totally agree with Fergal there. I think um, any player that, that that wants to come through will get through in any system. I think there should be a few more tournaments that should be the old tier system. That's just my opinion. I think it should be yeah. um, a bit more fair for the lower ranked players who are maybe struggling. Um, because you could draw like six, like my, me, my own personal experience, I've had a few tough draws, but I've still managed to, to win a few of them matches, you know. But I think um, the bottom line is if you're good enough, you'll come through. Simple as that. Well, that seems to be the general view of a lot of very experienced professional lads. And I think that, you know, like if you look back, Fergal, you'll remember this, Jordy, you will not because you're not old enough, but Fergal, you'll remember the days of Blackpool where you had maybe, I think you had something like 700 registered professionals, you know, yeah. where most of them, most of them are so dumb. They were wasting their time. You know, they were just coming along and paying a hundred pound or whatever to play and pay their registration fee. I can't remember what it was, but it was a lot of money and it was an awful lot of yeah. snooker. At least it's not in that place. Yeah, exactly. And I said, you may, you may argue the point that the young players coming on tour today have it difficult, but I don't think it's any more difficult than, you know, even my first year on tour, every week there was a turn of the qualifiers. The year before, Blackpool came into play as such. And again, in Blackpool, you'd be in the Norbert Castle for three or four months, maybe playing every day, tournament after tournament. So you might get beaten in a tournament today, you have another tournament tomorrow. It was constant play. But the first year I turned pro, you'd have a tournament, you'd go to all the shot for a few days, or Bolton, or Sheffield, and they're just back-to-back, -back, and you go to each of those, you had to win four matches to maybe get through. You had four matches in Bolton to get to Stoke-on-Trent, and you had five matches in Stoke-on-Trent to make the last 64 of Is the Jemison really? International, or whatever it was back in the day. So it wasn't easy then either. And again, there were so many more players that it was hard to get through. Whereas now, you're in the 128, and the money is very good. So if you can win a match or two, you're picking up 10, you know, five, 10 grand or something to give you a bit of a boost. But no matter what system, nobody had it easy. Mark Allen didn't have it easy. Ronnie O'Sullivan didn't have it easy. Whatever system. Yes, you, you always want it to be a bit fairer, but, you know, nobody's had it easy. You know, nobody gets there. You tortured those lads. Virgil, you must have tortured some of those lads at Blackpool. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, it, was, it was them or, it was them or me <laughs> I think I think the uh, sport in general I think it's not designed to be easy I think you know everybody just wants the opportunity to play and we've got plenty of that like Fergal says we've got 35 tournaments to play in at least you know it seems like there's every week you know we're playing you know we, there couldn't be a better time to be a snooker player you know, I think, um, and you, know, you win a few games, you get a bit of money, you know, takes the pressure off a wee bit. You know, it's not designed to be easy. You know, it's it's a professional sport at the end of the day. Lads, I can't think of a better way to finish this. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you both on. I hope that, um, Thank you very obviously, much. this... This gets uploaded on YouTube, so it's a little bit of background stuff. We've had this discussion, so if we live long enough, we can look back on this in 10 years and have a good laugh at ourselves, you know. YouTube will be finished by then anyway, but I'll still be here broadcasting, you know, up-and-coming new players, you know, and they won't have more time to watch you too. 
no one will have the time to watch you. <laughs> We're good at putting people to sleep. <laughs> right, Lance, thanks very much for joining us. Okay. Thank you very much. We'll have, uh, Thank you very much. Glad, you know, we'll have, uh, next week. We will have, uh, we're going to have next week, next week, we are going to have Peter Lanes and Oliver Lanes, father and son, father and son, joining us for a chat. Very interesting. We don't see it very often. Um, talking about what it's like on the tour. Peter's obviously had a, fair, you know, a fairly long career in snooker on and off. And young Oliver, young Ali has been on the tour for a while. Uh, he knows what it's like and how tough it is to get yourself on the board and move up the rankings. And that's the kind of things we're going to be talking to uh, Peter and Ali about next week when we get them on here. So thanks very much for joining us, guys. And we will uh, just say we'll see you again next week. Thank you very much.